The Unshackled Waves, episode 110. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Australia Day 2018 is now not far away. However, throughout the year we have seen an unprecedented amount of attacks on our National Day. We have seen three inner city Melbourne councils cancel their Australia Day festivities. We have seen demands for our colonial statues uh, to be removed. And we have also seen the ABC's youth radio station Triple J decide to move its annual Hottest 100 countdown from Australia Day. Australia Day in recent years has also been besieged by Invasion Day protests in our major cities by the usual leftist crowd uh, blocking traffic and inciting other forms of antisocial behaviour. But the fight back has begun. Mark Latham's Outsiders has launched its Save Australia Day campaign, which will feature an advertising campaign putting the case for keeping Australia Day on the 26th of January. Heading this campaign is Alice Springs councillor Jacinta Price. She was originally a singer, but has now chosen to pursue uh, a career in activism on Indigenous issues. And when I say Indigenous issues, I mean uh, proper ones, such as preventing domestic violence and sexual abuse in Indigenous communities. She's not interested in indulging in the endless talk fests about constitutional recognition or treaties. She has addressed the National Press Club and appeared on the ABC's Q&A, as well as appearing regularly on Sky News and 2GB. Her activism has certainly made her a target of the left, but she has proven herself unafraid in this regard. We thought we'd invite her on to discuss the Save Australia Day campaign, as well as her other activism. Jacinta, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, you've taken on the, the role of being the, the face of the Save Australia Day campaign, which has been launched by uh, Mark Latham's Outsiders. There'll be advertisements on uh, television and, and radio. Now, you put forward the, the case for uh, Australia Day in those ads, but I'd, I'd like you to um, stay here in your own words. Uh, why did you decide to get involved in the campaign? Why does Australia Day need saving? Uh, I got involved because I think we are missing the point as to what, you know, why we celebrate Australia Day. Uh, we're missing the fact that we are so focused on um, so many negative um, issues with regard to our country, we completely forget that we are one of the most luckiest countries in the world. And um, you know, so many issues are painted in black and white when really um, it's really not that simple at all. Uh, and those who campaign fiercely against Australia Day, who are descendants of Aboriginal people, um, themselves are of mixed heritage. So it doesn't really uh, make sense. Um, I, I, you know, I put forward the fact, the, what, the reason why I support Australia Day, uh, because I, I, I like the fact that we can, you know, celebrate a country um, that has helped make me who I am. I mean, if we, um, you know, if, if the first fleet hadn't arrived in 1788 and, and then the following fleets, well, then I certainly wouldn't be here because my mother is, is a Warburry woman um, and my father is a white Australian man. And, um, you know, I've grown up in these two very, couldn't get two different cultures, um, very different cultures in the world, I think, uh, you know, with one another, living with one another, being part of one another, I feel I am a product of um, reconciliation in this country. And, you know, regardless of what happened in our past, we cannot change that. You know, I, my ancestors were brought here in shackles. Um, my grandfather was once shackled, um, just like the images, you know, we see of, of Aboriginal men um, being shackled. Um, but he not once... Um, you know, projected any any dislike or, or blame or or hate toward Aboriginal people. Um, he understood that life was very difficult uh, before white fellas came. You know, uh, Aboriginal people were trying to um, 
get away with killing one another. Uh, your traditional enemies were were at war with one another. And then white fellows came along and, and Aboriginal people were at war with them. Um, some Aboriginal people uh, ended up having relationships with, with white people, even even back when, when white fellows first came to this country. So it's it's really, it's it's complex. And it's really not as straightforward as white versus black as um, yeah, activists would have have you think. And again, if we change the date, it's not going to change what happened to both sides of my ancestors uh, back in the day. And if you choose to be offended by it, well, that is simply your choice. You could choose to be a bigger person and you could choose to say, okay, well, you know, I want to take the morning and, and I want to reflect on our country's history and think of those who have passed away, you know, think of those who stood on the shores in 1788. Uh, and then as the day progresses, uh, you know, let's look at how our country has pr progressed, how, um, you know, the fact that, that we have the oldest, the world's oldest living culture and, and a modern Australian culture and we're not wanting to kill one another. Um, uh, we're in fact wanting to come together and solve our issues and the vast majority of us in this country are not in fact racist. We want to come together. Let's look at all those wonderful positive aspects of our cult culture and move forward and look forward in hope that things can change and things can be better. Um, you know, I, I just, I, if we decide to change Australia Day, what will be the next demand from activists? We have heard our government say sorry. Um, now we want to change change Australia Day, and apparently, according to it's according to a small group of people that, well, if you do this, then this is the act of reconciliation. This is, you know, who keeps telling us what is supposed to be, you know, setting the agenda for us? Um, it's a small group of people, and the rest of the Australians are going, hang on a second, I'm. You know, they're being singled out and called racist, but they're going, I'm, I'm not a racist person. I don't like being called a racist person. I've said sorry. I've done this. I've done that. Why do we keep being, um, why do we keep being held to ransom? Why do these demands keep being made? Because we keep uh, folding and going, right, oh, okay, we'll do this then. You, I can bet you, uh, you know, that if we go ahead and change Australia Day, there will be another demand to follow because what hasn't happened is the activists and those who don't feel like they're reconciled with white people will think of something else. They, the activists will, you know, they haven't yet forgiven, haven't forgiven. Sorry has occurred. Forgiveness needs to take place in order for this idea of healing to take place. The two have to go hand in hand and we're not seeing that. What we're seeing is it's almost like, you know, a kid with a toy. He said, give me back my toy. Right, oh, give me back. Okay, now you've got to do this. Now you've got to do this. No, I'm not satisfied until you do this, this, this and this. When will it end? Let's keep Australia Day and let's be big enough and grown up enough as a country to all of us learn our history, learn it and all, all with all its complexities and understand that it's not just simply black and white and and yeah let's reflect and let's take take in and understand what happened um, to indigenous people in this country but let's move forward let's recognize what we do have you know let's recognize that we are one of the world's luckiest countries and we do a bloody good job at you know this idea of multiculturalism we do a good job at recognizing one another and making the effort to do so and you know I, it's time to move forward it's time to really move forward forgiveness needs to happen and changing the day the day of australia you know australia day isn't going to mean anything to this country's most marginalised. It's not going to do a single thing for Aboriginal people, um, for the children who are, you know, suffering sexual abuse, for the women who are suffering domestic violence. It is not going to do a single thing for them. It doesn't make, it doesn't make a difference. I've, I've gone out to communities and I've asked my family, well, what do you think about changing Australia? They, they couldn't care less. You know, they've got, they've got greater worries than changing the day of Australia Day. 
Oh, yeah, you're, you're too right on that. I mean, uh, if we, you know, change Australia Day, there'll be another another demand. Like, it's it, it's never enough. The argument that's put forward is that Australia Day is is not inclusive to Indigenous people. But uh, I think, uh, uh, as you said, it's, it's time to move forward and uh, also reflect on the Australian project because... No, I think everybody recognises that things have happened in, you know, uh, Australian history that were wrong. Our governments have, you know, done, you know, bad things not just to Indigenous people but uh, other groups. But the the great thing about Australia is that we recognise that they were wrong, and our, our governments and our people uh, decided to to change. And Australia Day is meant to reflect on you know the journey that we we've been on and to celebrate that you know we are one of the wealthiest nations in the world we're also uh, one of the most you know multicultural we're we're one of the world's success stories in in nations where we've overcome the 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 mistakes and yeah, reflect on just how lucky we are yeah um, exactly i mean that's the thing we uh, you know, it'd be different if we were a country run by a dictator who said no, you know, who, who was in fact racist and, um, you know, told Aboriginal people no to absolutely everything and you must remain, you know, you must remain marginalised. No, there is opportunity in this country and a lot of Aboriginal people have taken advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and again, those who say that they're, they are offended are more than likely of mixed heritage. So what are they offended by the percentage of them that is, is white fella? You know, it, it is an internal struggle that I believe a lot of activists have. With, and until they um, recognise that it is an internal struggle that they're dealing with and they're projecting that onto others, nothing's going to change for them. Um, healing doesn't, other people don't heal you. You have to do that within yourself uh, and, and, and to project, you know, your, your, your feelings of insecurity and your feelings of hatred toward others isn't, isn't healing you in any way, shape or form and it's not contributing to your wider community in a positive manner either. Um, and being offended, well, that's your choice but it's not everyone else's responsibility around you to change in order to make you feel better about yourself. And too often when we, you know, we see activism, the activist is about making you feel like crap to make them feel better. But it doesn't solve any internal issues and it doesn't solve the issues of the most marginalised people in this country who are going about, um, you know, not not having to, you know, say that they're a proud this or a proud that every five minutes. They're just being Aboriginal people in remote communities. You know, political correctness doesn't has nothing to do with their lives. Identity politics plays no part uh, in the lives of the most marginalised Aboriginal people. They're not insecure about, insecure about their Aboriginality. They're just being Aboriginal uh, who are, happen to be the most marginalised Aboriginal people in this country uh, and just surviving, basically. They're not thriving, they're just surviving. Political correctness and, and guilt politics and all those sorts of issues play no part in their lives. All those issues play in the part of the lives of the activists and the left. And why? because they're insecure about who they are. I mean, let's get real here. <laughs> the, best, the best thing you can do as an individual is address your internal conflicts and your internal issues. The best things we can do as Aboriginal people is address our internal issues and solve our own problems for ourselves. Uh, we've seen the greatest uh, attacks on Australia Day this year come from the decisions of three uh, inner Melbourne councils to cancel their Australia Day uh, commemorations. Now, they claim that they made uh, these decisions by consulting with their local uh, Indigenous population, but uh, where you're from, uh, Alice Springs, where you're a councillor, um, there's been no move to, you know, cancel Australia Day, and uh, I assume that it's uh, comm commemorated uh, there just like it is in, in most, most of Australia? Yeah, look, um 
for Territorians, Australia Day is important to us because we just like to celebrate what it means to be Australian, um, the positive parts of who we are in the Territory. We actually get on with one another regardless of our backgrounds. We intermarry with one another, you know. We, we, we've got so many mixed heritage, like we've got different family groups, different language groups that intermarry one another that are indigenous, but then we've got white fellows that marry black fellows. Um, you know, if you go further north toward Darwin, we've got, you know, Asian Aboriginal mix, we've got a big Greek community. We like to get on with things and we don't like the politics of the South to poison the way we do things in the Northern Territory. So issues like, you know, councils changing Australia Day. I mean, I think the, the green aligned candidates who got onto council, I don't think they'd be um, willing to bring up that particular issue because I think considering the results of the last election, um, I, I made it very clear that um, as, a, as a Territorian, as a woman from Alice Springs, who's both black fella and white fella, I would not be, I would be completely against changing um, Australia Day um, if, that were, if that were brought up within our council. And that's how locals voted. They voted on the fact that they are sick of the nonsense and they just want to get on with things and they don't want Australia Day changed. Um, I know I know how my community thinks and feels and uh, you know this is this is evident in in the way that they voted me back into uh, the last election so yeah you know we're not looking to try and be virtue signalers we know what indigenous issues here in the territory are everybody's issues so we're not going to pretend um, you know that you know the wifelers in our community aren't going to pretend um, to stand up and be virtue signalers um, to make themselves look good and as if they're doing something for Aboriginal people because there are a hell of a lot of white fellas in our communities that work amongst and with and for Aboriginal people and know what the issues are on the ground and unfortunately for the for the greens in 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 the suburbs of Melbourne well, you, you are completely and utterly removed from the sort of circumstances where the most marginalised Aboriginal people live and changing the day does nothing for them. You are not a hero um, because you've changed the date of Australia Day. Um, yeah, so you can either come up here and get an education, learn more about what goes on for the lives of the most marginalised, um, but I'd say that's probably too hardball for you because the easy way out is to change the date of Australia Day. Now you were originally uh, a singer and you've chosen uh, this uh, new uh, career in uh, activism on Indigenous issues and uh, mo uh, most of us who have engaged in activism know it's not for the, you know, faint-hearted, you, you know, you cop, you know, uh, I'm sure you know a lot of, you know, abuse and accusations. Uh, given that, um, why, did, why did you decide to go from, you know, something which, like, singing which is you know obviously uh a very you know uh warm and fuzzy industry and put yourself in the the firing line of uh, currently yeah i guess i went into politics well and, and activism um because while singing is a beautiful thing and is very much a part of who i am um it, it also i guess you know i, I separated the activism from the singing and uh, I then I guess watched my mother get into politics. I'm, I'd known for many many years that um, indigenous issues were never seen you know seeming to be resolved and I've lived my life um, burying my family members. Um, I've lived with you know death since I was since since a young age, I, I lost my brother to leukemia when I was three, and he he was ten years old. My mother almost died when I was six. Um, you know, apart from those sorts of experiences, just constantly seeing my family die as a result of family violence, alcohol, uh, substance abuse. Um, you know, family being locked up and all those sorts of issues. You know, as well as the fact that I know. Um, growing up an Aboriginal uh, girl and woman that Aboriginal women are second rate in traditional Aboriginal culture and having the understanding of traditional culture as well as understanding um, the Western way of doing things and having both those sides of me you know understanding both sides as I've grown up has really led me to um, well I come from a position where I understand and I think one of the main issues going on here is the fact that a lot of people just don't understand. They don't understand 
um, you know, what parts of Aboriginal culture are affecting Aboriginal people in a detrimental way that haven't been addressed um, by um, governments because governments haven't understood. But also I think activists, while they had their place uh, bringing about equal rights for Aboriginal people in this country, have now gone too far. And uh, a lot of activists, in fact, who, um, you know, unfortunately for their circumstances are removed from traditional culture, don't understand its impact on the most marginalised in this country and are just as much removed from it um, as many of our po political leaders have been for many, many years. So in my position, I'm obliged, I guess, to speak for those uh, um, who, whose voices haven't been heard. You know, in the Northern Territory, we're still the final frontier. Um, it, it's still it's still only really, you don't really know that much about what goes on in remote communities unless you, you've lived in them or, or spent um, time throughout your life being there in remote communities. And um, so there's been a bit of a, I guess, a blanket over that. And I'm, you know, I can't stand back and watch all this go on knowing what I know and not, um, be part of making change and having watched my mother go through that process having seen what she's experienced and understanding her strength in doing that and being part of that and being an Aboriginal woman whose first language is not English um, become an MP um, and about speaking the truth and what is really going on then you know I, I've had to follow in, in her footsteps but I've also had to follow with the understanding of both cultures and I guess um, a little more, um, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little, I guess, you know, she is, she still holds a very traditional views in some cases. Um, you know, she, she believes that there are some people who, who are capable. Me, on the other hand, um, yeah, there might be those people out there, but my belief is we're much stronger than that. And there are other ways that we can also fight um, for the rights of women and children. And um, it needs to be done in, in, in a way that the rest of the world is going to be able to understand. And so it being that link between the two cultures, I guess, which is important for me to be. I did it. I used to do it with my music. Now I can do it um, on, on, on a platform of using, you know, activism and fighting for the rights of the most marginalised, which I just don't think it's been done properly. You know, we Aboriginal women have not had our feminist movement. We have had to stand in solidarity with Aboriginal men. We've been told to do so for the rights of Indigenous people against racism. Well, in my view, there are far more people in this country who are prepared to bend over backwards for Aboriginal people than there are racists. So now it's time for our rights to be recognised as women um, and now it's time um, for the violence to end for Aboriginal women and children. And so speaking the truth for me is, utmost, is the, the most important thing that I can do in my life um, because these circumstances have to change. They have to change. I'm sick of burying my family. Uh, just earlier this year, I helped lift my auntie uh, after she'd collapsed and died in, in a town camp. I, ha I helped family lift her into a police body bag and watch her be taken away. I, I have had to ID, you know, my, my cousin's body after she um, had died in, in an alcohol-related car crash. I've had to comfort children who's just lost their mothers. And um, I've had to fight for the right of kids in our family to be given to families that we've chosen who happen to be you know, white foster carers that we know well, we've had to fight the system for them to be in their care because the system's turned around and said that um, their culture is what's more important. Well, currently their culture is absolutely dysfunctional. So until that culture becomes functional again, I would not place children in my family in the care uh, of, of those who are part of a dysfunctional culture. It's as simple as that. Rights of women and children need to come first. Yeah, when you put it like that, it's it definitely feels like that you feel that you you know wouldn't be you know f having a you know good life unless you were trying to you know change things. 
Absolutely. Uh, it, you know, whatever work that I've done, um, whatever projects I've pursued, whatever whatever it is I've been part of, it's always had to be in such a way that it's somehow contributing to the betterment of, you know, the most marginalised, um, my family. Uh, and I've always, you know, hoped to be, I guess, a positive role model for my people um, from back when I was, you know, when I was a teenager performing rap and hip hop with my cousins, you know, young indigenous fellas. We used to hit the stage and do that, one, because we loved the music, but two, because we wanted to show our peers that there were other things that we could do um, to be positive in our community. And also we wanted to show our community, you know, that not all Aboriginal kids um, are, are criminals, you know. We, 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 wanted to, we wanted to be that positive image and so I guess that's continued on for me in my life. And, and I guess being a mother also, there's that aspect, you know, I've always got to be, I've got these young eyes looking at me, seeing how they should be, you know, when they grow up. Uh, my eldest is, it's in fact his birthday today, he's, he's 19 today, um, and I have a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old a, a stepson. I have four boys, so it's really important um, when you're a parent also to be a positive role model for your kids. Um, so, because they're tomorrow's leaders, they're, they're the future, they're going to be running the country one day. And obviously the, the feedback that you get uh, on the ground there in Alice Springs encourages you and you were recently uh, re-elected to the uh, Alice Springs uh, Council. The, the, you're on the, the mayor's uh, ticket who was uh, re-elected. So it uh, sounds like that you know, what you're doing there is, you know, it's, it's really resonating with people. Yeah, and, and again, I think, um, you know, I had a landslide vote of over over two two thousand um, uh, first prefer first uh, primary votes, and um, and I was you know six hundred odd votes ahead of the next candidate, uh, which told me that one I stood up for the fact that we need to uh, keep Australia Day. Two, I guess I, I speak like a Territorian, you know, as I as I'd mentioned, for us Territorians we just get on with things. Um, we, we don't like for politics to get in the way of getting on with one another and attempting to solve the really difficult issues. Um, you know, we're more no nonsense, no bullshit, no political correctness. We want to get on with things. And, you know, I speak on behalf of white fellas and black fellas in my community. And that's, that's really what, you know, resonated with them during the council elections. And, and that's why they voted me in and, and on a regular basis I have people come up to me um, congratulating me and thanking me for just speaking the truth and um, you know telling me that they voted for me and I think in this day and age right now with with everything you know, with, 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 with the lies that are told and the political through political correctness people are just sick of being lied to and and, and they want the truth to be known. They just want straight talking and, and straight walking too. You've got to walk, you've got to walk that talk at the same time. Now, a lot of people would refer to you as a conservative Indigenous activist. I'm not sure if you uh, like that term, but um, uh, your activism, it's made you uh, a target of the, the left uh, in the uh, f major cities. Um, you know, there, there's the you know usual uh, accusations. They call you you know a puppet of white people. There's also the term uh, coconut. Um, you know, how do you respond to sort of you know these you know ac accusations? Because they're basically saying that you know your views are not your own. Um, yeah, I guess I scare people a lot in that <laughs> in that aspect. Uh, I've always had the had the attitude since I was a teenager. I think. Um, which I think has allowed me to walk on stage and perform it as I have, that I really couldn't care less what people thought of me. Um, you know, when people call names, um, they're incapable of actually arguing or debating uh, any of the points that I raise. So, you know, it's a weakness on their behalf and it says a lot more about them as individuals than it does of me. And I guess if I'm not, you know... Um, if, if I, I'm not having people, you know, <laughs> speak out against me in, in such a capacity, then I mustn't be doing something right. 
Um, yes, people call names, um, try to pigeonhole me because I confuse them. I confuse the left because, yes, I'm an Aboriginal woman, but hey, I'm also half white fella too. That's what people forget is that uh, I'm human. Funny enough, I'm human. In fact, we're all human. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> um, well, I guess you know what it points out is that really um, these idiots think that uh, because I'm an Aboriginal woman, I should be acting and behaving and thinking uh, in the way that they think I should. Um, why should I be an individual and and step out of those stereotypes that they've created for me? Um, because I've got a brain of my own and I can think for myself, in fact, and what I present are the facts. What I present is the truth. What I present is my knowledge on traditional Aboriginal culture, the culture that I was grown, gr brought up with. I know my jukurpa, I know my, my skin name, I know my language. I know all of those things uh, and those who attack me are uh, insecure about not knowing those sorts of things for themselves. Um, for me, you know what, it's like, well, I'm a bit like the blob. They can shoot whatever, they can fire at me whatever they like. I will just keep growing. I don't back away. Um, again, I speak for those who don't have a voice. I stand up for the marginalised. Um, I don't stand up to try and stamp on the marginalised. I stand up for them and I will continue to do so regardless uh, of the sorts of attacks I get because for every person that attacks me there's about 20 other people who are there with their hand out supporting me who understand what common sense is and understand the need for the truth to be told. Why do the left, they, why do they feel the need to capture uh, the, the issue of uh, Indigenous welfare? I mean, uh, as we spoke about before, most of them are based in, you know, the inner, inner cities. Some of them have, you know, never been to, you know, Alice Springs or uh, a remote uh, community. They have no idea about, you know, what are the issues on the ground. They don't want to hear about, you know, their, um, you know, uh, domestic violence uh, and abuse. Why, why do they feel the need to, you know, Im impose, you know, their... What, what they think is going on when in reality they've, they've just got no idea about uh, the situation. They want to feel important. They want to feel as though they're contributing in some way but um, what they don't realise is because of their ignorance and lack of understanding and lack of education and lack of um, actual life lived in remote communities, um, they're actually they're contributing to the demise of Aboriginal people. They're keeping Aboriginal people uh, in a stereotype that we're victims and that we're helpless, and the white man is the evil enemy who keeps who keeps us down. Uh, and so they're doing us a disservice by feeding you know lies, but trying to prop themselves up um, to make themselves feel better because guilt politics has got, has got a stranglehold on them because they listen to the activists. And what the activists do is they, in order to make themselves feel better about their insecurities, they project their insecurities onto others. Uh, they make others feel bad in order to make them feel good. And these, what the left has done ha that is they've bought into this guilt politics. And guilt politics doesn't work. It's stifling. It, 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 it doesn't help um, anybody, and, um, especially Aboriginal people. Uh, and, and, and really, you know, they want to have an opinion. They want to have an opinion that's heard within, you know, within the grand scheme of things. But they feel like that if they say, oh, well, you know, well, it was white people that did this to Aboriginal people in the first place. What they're doing is taking away the fact that we are human beings ourselves. We are capable human beings. We are capable of all um, that it means to be human. Back in the day before whitefellas came, we fought our traditional enemies, we murdered, we raped, we pillaged, we did all of those sorts of things because we were human beings. Whitefellas, this other tribe came along, uh, they were stronger than us. And unfortunately, we lost the war. Um, however, many of us now have mixed heritage. We are all human beings with, with a history that's not very nice and a history that we all need to learn and understand uh, in, in, in all of its entirety. 
Um, for, for example, here in here in Alice Springs, we had the Coniston Massacre, which took place in 1928, and my grandfather was an adolescent when this happened. He was 30 kilometres and um, running away from the killings going on with his close family. Uh, now, we commemorated 75 years. Um, this is about 11 years ago. And um, what happened was we invited the descendants of the killers to that commemorative ceremony, and we said, we want you to be there because we don't want you to feel guilt or we don't want to blame you for what literally your grandfather did to our people. But we want to recognise that these were very difficult times in our history. You know, we were killing our traditional enemies. They were trying to kill us. White fellas were trying to kill us. We tried to kill white fellas. Um, and it was complex. And one of, one of the worst killers amongst that posse were, in fact, uh, was in fact an Aranda man from the Aranda tribe. So Aboriginal people were part of that as well. It's really, it's not as straight forward as black against white and white against black. And if you look at us now, <laughs> if you look at our, our own heritage, the fact that we are, so many of us, of mixed heritage, it's plain and simple. It's not as straightforward as black and white. We are mixed up human beings with lots of complexities and we don't recognise that and the left doesn't recognise that. The left pigeonholes everybody in a particular way to suit their own way of thinking and their own um, narrative and it doesn't work. It really doesn't work and it's not working clearly because the situation for Aboriginal people hasn't changed. I can't believe we're in this situation now where you're accused of being racist when you say you know things are you know not good uh in indigenous communities there's still uh, a lot of problems and uh the left they still you know say that you know our government is you know still being you know discriminatory and racist when there's been a bipartisan approach to you know the reconciliation project for the you know past 50 years uh you know there's been numerous government bodies uh, established to uh, look after uh, indigenous issues. Of course, we had the apology to the stolen generation. We're going through this process of uh, constitutional uh, recognition. So it's not that our governments haven't tried. Look, absolutely. You know, um, again, over and over again, I think the word racist um, has lost its meaning. I think it's just thrown out anything that any Aboriginal activist doesn't agree with now. Uh, yes, our government have tried. They have tried. And the one thing that we will, that we can see through this pattern over time is the fact that the lack of accountability has in fact come from Aboriginal people ourselves. Our people are suffering. We must drive the change within ourselves as individuals, within our families, within our wider communities, we must do more and stop expecting the government to. On one hand, we're saying, oh, we don't want the government to tell us what to do. But on, on the other hand, we've got our hand out going, we need resources to do this. We need resources to do that. This is why our people are not, uh, you know, are still marginalised because the government's not doing enough. We're expecting the government to parent our children, and then and now we're saying that we're we're scared of creating another stolen generation. However, what's going on with the parents? What's going on with the families? You know, these children should have the same rights as all other Australian children, but they don't, <laughs> and it's because our families are dysfunctional and aren't able to care for these kids. So. The emphasis is put on the fact that we need to put them into kin care. And so what happens then is you're taking kids from a dysfunctional situation, possibly into another dysfunctional situation. We wonder why this situation isn't getting better. It's not because of racism. And if we keep throwing out, you know, projecting the racism word, well, the government's just going to go, you know what, completely hands off, hands off. <laughs> and in fact, that's what's going on with kids in foster care. They're going hands off. Where it's created a stigma because of the stolen generation about how we deal with Aboriginal kids now, and now they're being removed at even more alarming rates um, than they have been. It's not a stolen generation. These kids are genuinely in circumstances where they should 
have the ability to have the same rights as any other Australian child. Oh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just so frustrating that the race card is used so often these days, it's become ridiculous. Accountability, taking responsibility, maybe if we try those, because that's doing something different to what's gone on in our country's history where governments have tried to solve our problems. No, we need to solve our problems. We need to take responsibility. We need to admit um, our part within the problem in order to be able to solve the problem. Now, the term Indigenous issues, it's a, a general uh, term. Obviously, when the left talk about Indigenous issues, they're talking more about these symbolic things. But obviously, your, uh, what you're, uh, you're advocating is, you know, actual things that are going to improve the welfare of I Indigenous people. And obviously, uh, domestic violence and uh, st uh, stopping sexual abuse is uh, what, uh, one of the things you're a strong campaigner on. Uh, uh, we have the uh, Closing the Gap report uh, every year, and, and it's always, you know, uh, Grim, a grim reading. There's still life expectancy is still um, lower. There's um, not as high rates of uh, education, Indigenous uh, health and employment uh, is also another key policy area that's always uh, debated. And we have this discussion, you know, every year where we say, you know, we must do better. Uh, you know, we've, re we've really got to, you know, try and uh, improve the situation. Uh, what do we need to, to do differently in those areas of health, education and employment? Sure. Well, I, you know, I'll always start off. Well, I think the very core issue is the family violence issue, is the you know abuse issue. Because if we don't fix that, well, then we we can't go further to start resolving the issues when it comes to education, employment, um, and health. Um, it, it is part of a health issue, I, I believe. Um, family violence. Um, well, there's also mental health uh, around those issues because those that have been brought up, you know, within a household. That, that have been victims of violence will be will have to deal with mental health issues as well as their physical um, health issues. Um, I, I think that you know education is extremely uh, important, and as we know in the Northern Territory, um, um, levels of uh, you know kids not attending school uh, is is pretty. Well, the biggest, the highest levels across the country are in the Northern Territory for kids not attending school, and this is, um, you know, this is due to once again parental responsibility. Uh, what we see also is we have young people having kids as young as you know, sometimes twelve years old. We're having babies having babies and ill-equipped to become parents which is why we're seeing children being left with grandparents uh, and that cycle sort of continuing. But why, you know, we have to look at why is it that we're having 12-year-olds having children? And again, that comes back to um, abuse, sexual abuse and that kind of behaviour which has become normalised in communities. Um, so, you know, there's all, all of these issues are interconnected. Uh, if we if we want to see Aboriginal people improve their lives, well then, welfare I believe is one of the biggest killers. Uh, passive welfare and not feeling like you know, as a human being, uh, the motivation to be supporting your family, to be working to support your family, which is what Aboriginal people once upon a time always did. Um, when my grandfather experienced. Uh, why fellas first coming into his world? Um, he 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 lived the land. He walked the land. He ensured his family survived off the land. But then when white fellas came along, he continued to do that. He took on uh, jobs. He took uh, mail by camelback. He was part of. Um, he, he was a labourer in the army. He worked on the school grounds. Uh, when what where the downfall occurred was when welfare was introduced. Uh, in, in our country's history and when Aboriginal people were unfortunately as much as you know equal pay was about recognising Aboriginal people as equal it also uh, meant a lot of Aboriginal people lost their jobs and that coupled with welfare 
was the beginning of the end for Aboriginal people. Prior to that, we are, in, our, in Australia's history, Aboriginal people were beginning to become part of the economy. Uh, uh, and in fact, from that point on when welfare was introduced was when incarceration rates um, began to climb for Aboriginal people as well. It's all, uh, it's all related to one another. Uh, th look, this is why I support s initiatives like the, the cashless debit card because I believe these are ways to help Aboriginal people to deal with um, the cash economy, which is an issue that Aboriginal people weren't, you know, I'm speaking about my mob who live in the bush whose first language is in English, never really learnt, understood how to control a cash economy. Uh, my people, when they get cash in their hand, they will distribute it amongst family almost immediately. Um, and it worked once upon a time when they were hunter-gatherers at bush. What, whatever wealth you had, you ensured your family survived, but that your wealth was your food. So you gave that to ensure that everyone survived. Now, when you have high numbers of alcohol um, abusers, uh, addicts within your family, there's a constant pressure and a constant demand on you to hand over your pay and your money, well then you're never actually ever going to get ahead. And so things like the cashless debit card support Aboriginal people to say, look, I can't give you my money because it's quarantined. It's my money. But it means Aboriginal people can learn how to budget. It means they can also um, keep their money and not give it to those affected by drugs and alcohol. It means that they can send their kids to school. Um, so there's issues like that. I think our children um, need to be supported better when it comes to education. Uh, yes, I believe it's important for Aboriginal kids to learn their language, but English is the most important language for kids to learn because it gives them the tools to survive in a modern world and to become part of an economy to ensure the modern way of survival, to look after your family, is, to, is through employment. Uh, you know, the one thing that I, will, I always point out in terms of the Closing the Gap report, it, it shows that there are more Indigenous um, graduates coming, coming out of university. Um, what I would say is, well, how many of those are actually Indigenous kids whose first language is not English. Uh, until we see more graduates coming through to university whose first language is Warbri, Pitinjara, Aranda, you know, whether it's Tiwi, whether it's Yolngu, um, unless we, until we see kids like that coming through university, then we're not closing that gap. What we're doing is we're seeing um, we're, we're, we're seeing middle class indigenous kids coming through university and that's that's fantastic but the most marginalised are still the most marginalised. Uh, I think that one thing I do have a gripe with is the way in which land councils um, control Aboriginal land and money. Uh, I feel like Aboriginal people should be able to take more control over economic development and opportunities on their own country. Um, and I think uh, when it comes to land rights, uh, I think you know, the laws need to be revisited and I think we need to give more um, responsibility to Aboriginal people on their own country to be able to create economic opportunity on their own land because as we see it now, uh, there's not enough opportunity within communities and, and too much welfare dependency. Uh, and I think when it comes to royalties handouts, that is also um, contributing to this idea of welfare dependency. I mean, who wants to work when you're getting large sums of royalties money distributed to your family? Uh, most of the time, and it's untaxed, the royalties uh, is spent on second-hand cars. So those who are making the most out of Aboriginal money through royalties are second-hand car dealers. Uh, so, you know, these are all issues that need to change. and. Um, with education, also health education. I think kids need to be taught in school with regard to different health issues. Um, I used to work with um, delivering health messages in remote communities through the form of musicals um, to children. And, um, you know, basic hygiene is one of the main messages that we would deliver. And, you know, you wouldn't believe it, but it's those sorts of 
it's the it's the idea that Aboriginal people in remote communities still don't know how to um, live within structures like houses. You know, Aboriginal people got given houses, but not taught how to uh, utilize houses, how to fix and repair their houses, like the simplest sorts of in the simplest ways. Um, when it comes to just basic hygiene, those sorts of issues. For, for some reason they've fallen by the wayside for a lot of Aboriginal people and, and that, that comes through education. Um, as soon as people are educated, the better because also they can't be taken advantage of. You know, we see a lot of Aboriginal people in communities being taken advantage of and I, and I hate to say it but Labor have been, um, <laughs> certainly in the Northern Territory, have taken advantage of Aboriginal people in remote communities for years and years and I saw it. Um, in my mother's in, in the last election where my mother lost her seat um, you know the because of a lot of Aboriginal people being uneducated um, a lot of men in those communities have controlled um, those communities for their own personal gain and benefit for the personal gain and benefit of their immediate families and to the detriment of women and children in communities so you know I could go on and on and on there are so many issues that need to be tackled um, differently and from a more honest perspective and from a perspective where you know we understand really what is going on um, first before you know we act upon uh, what we need to act upon but also Aboriginal people um, need to take ownership and um, blaming projecting blame outwardly is not working it's not working it, it never has and it's not going to work if we keep doing that. Yeah, it's been great to hear some actual practical uh, policy solutions rather than just the, you know, the usual buzzwords we hear from our politicians of, you know, health, education, uh, jobs. Uh, but thank you, uh, Justina, for uh, taking the time to speak with us today and good luck with the campaign based on the feedback uh, we receive on our Australia Day coverage. I certainly believe that Australians are on your side and this campaign will be well received. Yay! Go Australia! We're an awesome country. <laughs> yep, too right. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. If you want to support the Save Australia Day campaign, please go to support.marklathamsoutsiders.com and click on the Save Australia Day option. We certainly hope that Australia Day 2018 marks the fight back against the left attack on not just this day, but Australian culture and history. The Unshackled, of course, will continue to cover the lead up to Australia Day 2018 and update you on both the uh, attacks and the defences of the day. Uh, as I've previously stated, the Unshackled does not go on holidays. We will be going throughout the Christmas and uh, New Year break and also don't forget that voting is now open for our annual Unshackler Awards. Uh, so far we have posted the uh, 2017 Regressive of the Year and the 2017 Australian Patriot of the Year. So make sure that you uh, go and cast your vote for who you think is worthy of uh, those awards. So to all of our uh, listeners and viewers, a, a Merry Christmas from the Unshackled team and we'll continue to see you throughout the Christmas break. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.